All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is Luke Johnson, and I'm back with Dr. Jonathan Cook. Tonight, we talk Thomas Hardy's A Pair of Blue Eyes. Dr. Cook recently brought this uh, book to my attention after I had gone back and reread Wuthering Heights, and I was just telling Dr. Cook off camera that uh, I think I prefer it to Wuthering Heights and sort of mystified that more people don't know about it. And, uh, you know, Dr. Cook has a personal connection. I don't know if you want to share this. Uh, with, <laughs> with, with the text, you're very close to the text. Yeah, I have a, a strong tie to this book because I actually adapted it uh, to be a movie. Actually, it would m more likely be a miniseries. Um, uh, about 25 years ago, uh, my sister who works in Hollywood, works for Paramount, says, find a good Victorian novel to make into a movie and I thought uh, of some books and then thought of this one because it has um, it's a great plot and also uh, visually it's very stunning I mean a lot of the scenery that he evokes from Cornwall is uh, is just magnificent I've actually visited the area I, I went there in about 1999 I did a tour of Thomas Hardy country, so I know that area fairly well. I went to the church uh, that Hardy um, was restoring in the summer of uh, 1870. He went there as an architect uh, to restore this very small church at a place called, well, the church is St. Juliot's near Boss Castle on the north side of Cornwall. And... Um, it's where he met his future wife, Emma Gifford, uh, in the same way that Stephen Smith in the book uh, meets Elfrida Swancourt. So anyway, I, I adapted it, and maybe someday uh, <laughs> someone will pick it up because it's such a magnificent story. You know, it's one of the stories that's just waiting for a, a good uh, writer-director to adapt it. You know, that's totally possible. I, I do... I do a lot of uh, research in regards to Stanley Kubrick and there all these unfinished or unactualized or unrealized projects that are yeah. still getting greenlit today. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, what did he die? 99, um, you know, 22 years after yeah. his death. So it's, uh, it's entirely. And by the way, one of those screenplays that he wanted to do, I didn't know this. Did you know Kubrick wanted to make a John Mosby movie? Oh, no. Wow. That's yeah. 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 Amazing. It's, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. and, that, and that's actually what Would brought you and I to for coming full yeah. circle. That's what brought you and I together right. because I discovered a, a, a poem that Herman Melville had done about Mosby. Yeah. A scout and, towards Aldi. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what yeah. brought us together. So. Who knows? But le we'd like to see it happen in your lifetime, yes. which is going to be very long. Yes. You're probably going to outlive me. Yeah, well, we'll see. Uh, but uh, yeah, with all of these great series out today, I mean, there's so many just magnificent uh, TV movie series, you know, available today on all these apps. You know, it's just stunning. I mean, I've just been watching a series of just st stunningly well done um, series. We're watching something called A Place to Call Home now, an Australian series done in the early, well, 2013-14, but it's it's just great, great. So anyway, just to get back to our, our subject. So I'll be thinking about it. if anyone out there has a Hollywood connection or <laughs> knows, knows a yeah. producer or somebody that can turn Dr. Cook's screenplay. Yeah. Yeah, Did I think you, an English production, or maybe Australian, or maybe American. I don't know. English tend to do these things better, though. Um, but anyway, I'll think on it. I'll think on it. Maybe yeah. I've got somebody in the old Rolodex. Anywho, so why don't we talk about how this novel happened? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the time is 1872. And Hardy, uh, you know, he's born in 1840. He grew up in a, a little hamlet outside Dorchester in the county of Dorset. And, um, you know, he, he was the son of a mason and builder, lower class family origin. His was mother he just had, a... 
Yeah. When you say a mason, just a builder or a, a builder? Freemason? Well, uh, no, I mean a mason. He's a he's he works with bricks and mortar. You know, stone mason. Stone mason. So literally okay. a stone mason. Yeah, a builder. Um, so he's way down on the class roster. I mean, he's not a peasant or a you know a, a itinerant farm worker or anything. I mean, his his family is respectable, but they're poor. Uh, and he trains. He he leaves school as a teenager. His family can't afford to send him to school, so he apprentices with an architect in uh, Dorchester, John Hicks. Then he goes to London 19, uh, at the age of twenty-two, in uh, nineteen eighteen sixty-two, and then spends five years in London. He reads a lot, has some interesting experiences, works as an architect. Then he goes uh, back to uh, the Dorchester area because he wants to be a writer, but he still has to work as an architect to make a living. So then, uh, as I said, in 1870, he went on assignment to help restore this old um, church in called St. Juliot's in North Cornwall. Um, and um, he is uh, smitten by the the daughter of the rector there, uh, her name's Emma Gifford, they're about the same age in their early 30s. Or no, he's 30 at that time. And uh, But it's going to take a bit of work to get her to marry him because her father is a snob and thinks Hardy comes from low origins and you know thinks that his daughter shouldn't have anything to do with him. The same way in the book that Stephen Smith is rejected by... Uh, um, uh, you know, Elfrida's father. Um, so he goes back to visit a few times with Emma, uh, maintains the acquaintance, and then he, you know, he wants to launch his career as a writer. So 1870-71, he, he publishes a book called Desperate Remedies, which is a thriller, really, sensational novel. I mean, his first book was called The Poor Man and the Lady, uh, about a love affair between, you know, and, uh, a, a poor man and a lady, in other, in other words, an upper-class woman. And he, um, he was unable to publish that, but he kind of cannibalized parts of that for his early novels. And um, so his first book, Desperate Remedies, 1871, is a sensational book, kind of in the school of Wilkie Collins, uh, you know, all this kind of mystery and hairbreadth escapes. That was the popular literature at the time. That's the way to sell books. Uh, after that, Under the Greenwood Tree, which is a kind of idyllic romance, um, kind of lighthearted love story with a lot of pastoral influence, comes out in 1872. And then 1873, he gets this idea for A Pair of Blue Eyes, and he He's inspired by the setting of where Emma Gifford lived in North Cornwall. And he bases the beginning of the book on, you know, the fact that he visited there as a young architect. Of course, Stephen Smith is much younger than he was when he went there. But basically, the love triangle between Elfrida, Stephen Smith, and Henry Wright is is kind of roughly based on Hardy himself, and then his older mentor, which is a guy named Horace Moole, or Moe, uh, who was his uh, kind of intellectual guide when he was a teenager living in Dorchester, or outside Dorchester. So Hardy contracts with a guy named Tinsley, who has a magazine and a publishing house, to publish the book in installments, monthly installments, serial publication starting in uh, running from 1872, uh, roughly September 1872 to summer 1873. And it comes out as a book in the spring of 1873. Three volumes, that was the kind of triple decker was the standard Victorian novel of uh, people in the mid nineteenth, mid and later 19th century. Um, so uh, Hardy wrote it kind of in a rush. He wrote, he wrote it in about seven months from uh, starting in about summer of 1872 to 
the uh, spring of 1873. So it's his third novel. His next book, uh, which he contracted for as he was finishing this one, was Far From the Madding Crowd. And he published that with uh, in the Cornhill magazine, which is a little more prestigious than Tinsley's magazine, Tinsley. Uh, and his editor there was Leslie Stephen, who was the great Victorian man of letters and father of Virginia Woolf. So the book comes just before his breakthrough novel, which was Far From the Madding Crowd. But it was a popular novel, and it was the first book that appeared with his name on the uh, title page, because then he you know, he could establish himself as a as a literary figure. Um, so it wasn't, you know, it should have been his breakthrough book because it's such a great story, but it was really far from the Madden crowd, I think, that got more attention because it came out in a more prestigious magazine as a serial, The Cornhill, and um, I think it got a little more publicity uh, as well because I don't think Tinsley really worked hard to get get an audience for it. I should note for those hardy heads out there, we also did Far From Mad and Crowd. Yes. Uh, and, and so go you check the back catalog. You can also to listen to that discussion as well. Yes. And you can also purchase the Barnes & Noble edition of Far From Mad and, the Mad and Crowd that I edited with my introduction, oh, yeah. my introduction That's right. and, and notes. So... Uh, <clears throat> I forget you're such a big celebrity. I, we've become such good <laughs> friends. I, 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 yeah. I, sh I should remind myself that I should be in a constant state of awe of your accomplishments. Yes, well, would know? that the royalty checks would still come in, but that, that's, <laughs> that's uh, not been true for many, many years. So anyway, the book uh, <clears throat> was, you know, his third novel, and... Um, it, uh, you know, is not really read that often unless people just sit down and read the whole Hardy canon, as some people do once in a while. But you don't certainly wouldn't read this book in college or, or you know, college courses or even high school English courses. Although I, I taught it well, one year, actually. Why, why, why do you say certainly? I mean, it seems like because it'd be... it's always the greatest hits that get attention. Yeah. So, Test of the Durbervilles, Jude, maybe, um, uh, you know, May of Casterbridge, Return of the Native. Those, those are the big ones. Is there like a, a a school that has that is known for its hardy scholars? Like, if, if someone uh, that's really... a good point. That's a good question. Um, I don't think. Well, I would say there was a hardy scholar at Yale, Rosemary Morgan, um, who is publishes a hardy journal there. Hardy, the Thomas Hardy Review. Although she's, I don't know, I'm, I went to a Hardy conference at, at Yale about 15 years ago, and um, there are people from around the world there, well, mainly England and, and the U.S., but she was a rather peculiar woman, and uh, she tends to deal with you know, women and Hardy exclusively. But I would not say that I know of any particular place to, to study Hardy, but you can join the Thomas Hardy Society. And, um, you know, that's pretty active in England and, and to a certain extent in the U.S. You know, you mentioned earlier how you, uh, uh, were co you tried to turn into a, a screenplay. And you're not the only person to have that idea. I just did a quick look at the Wikipedia page. And apparently, someone wanted uh, Sir Ed, uh, Edgar Elgar. Elgar yeah, El Edward Elgar wanted to make an opera of it. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I guess the I guess the BBC Radio did a uh, audio book of it, and they had a uh, good old Jeremy Irons play Henry Knight. So maybe J Jeremy, oh. uh, Jeremy, if you're listening. <laughs> Jeremy, yeah. we, I love you, buddy. Yeah. I, I've been a big Maybe. fan since I was a little kid. <laughs> you know, yes, we got yes. a screenplay here, buddy. <laughs> he, he, could, he could be listening. He could be listening. It's possible. Yes. Yeah, I once saw him in a pub in Stratford on Avon because um, he'd been doing a Shakespeare play there in about in the 80s. Um, but... Um, Anyway, so to get back to Hardy, 
uh, autobiographical elements. Should we talk about that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's it sounds like you've hit on some of the autobiographical yeah. elements. I mean, Hardy was he was kind of touchy about that because I think people who knew him could say, yeah, obviously, you know, he's Stephen Smith, but he, you know, there's a there's a core of his life there, but it's not it's not um, heavily weighted towards that. I mean, Henry Knight, as I said is sort of the mentor figure that Horace Mole was to him. You know, Horace Mole, eight years older than Hardy, went to Oxford, Cambridge. Um, but of course, there was no, uh, you know, shared love interest between them. Um, but definitely, Stephen Smith and the the challenge of his social class to um, Mr. Swancourt was, was a big issue uh, for Hardy himself when he's trying to get Emma Gifford to marry him. Um, Did so, Hardy have any uh, near-death experiences? No, that was uh, of of Henry Knight hanging on the cliff there. Yeah, um, that was a Which, one. That's an amazing scene. He actually it Hardy, is an amazing. You text. You got a hold of me, and that's where I had just finished that scene. And you're like, look, it's it, the ending is going to be. That's yeah. going to be. That's really going to hit hit you with a punch. I was like. Hey, I don't know if it can. I don't <laughs> know. I don't that. know if it can get. I don't know if it can get more intense. Oh than yeah, I know. hanging off the cliff. That scene is so uh, visceral because you can really you can understand how it happened. You know, his hat blows off. He says, "Oh, I'll just go down." Then he starts slipping on the grass. Then before he knows it, he's right on the edge there with his foot, you know, on a little protruding rock. <clears throat> but interestingly enough, Hardy used he was inspired for part of that especially when henry knight is looking at the geological formation of the rock and thinking about trilobites and the evolution of life all of that is partly based on um uh, leslie stevens essay about hiking in the alps he he's he wrote a, a little story called five bad minutes on a mountain or something like that <clears throat> which is exactly about hanging there not knowing if you're going to fall down thousands of feet on a mountain cuz Stevens was a was a big alpinist you know big climber um and uh so Hardy used some of that he he also um apparently his Emma Gifford and he had, uh, Emma Gifford had an experience of almost getting blown off the face of a cliff <coughs> when she was out walking once nearby because, you know, some, I guess the cliff in the book is about 650 feet, but there's some really rugged shoreline there, uh, big dramatic drop-offs to the ocean, and you're, you're basically looking northwest towards Ireland from there because you're, you're down... Uh, from Bristol, you know, down the coast, and uh, Ireland is sort of right above you, and nearby is Tintagel, which is a great little town where King Arthur ha apparently, you know, had a legendary castle on a little island right off the coast there. So there's a lot of Arthurian lore associated with that area in North Cornwall. <clears throat> so I would say if you read, you know, Thomas Hardy's life, you'll see some resemblances the church, of course, that is the begin. You know, the reason for Stephen Smith's trip there is the church that uh, Hardy, you know, pretty much based on Saint Juliot. And if you go to Saint Juliot today, you can still see a plaque saying this is where Thomas Hardy met Emma Gifford. But it's a very rural area, very nondescript, nothing around there much. Um, you know, country lanes and and a little town called Boscastle which is on the coast. It's kind of a little fishing village right below um, this, this place, St. Juliot's. So it would have been a very small parish <clears throat> for, for uh, Reverend Gifford, Emma, uh, Emma's father. So there, uh, we can see the autobi autobiographical dimensions, but it's not like a one-to-one -one sort of connection. There's enough that, you know. Yeah, a lot of literary see, influences too, yeah. Yeah. And as far as the literary influences, you mentioned Leslie Stevenson. <clears throat> Leslie Stephen, yeah. Leslie Stephen, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, who, who else was Thomas Hart? You said he he went through a period where he was just 
reading constantly for yeah. five years. What, what, yeah. was he, what was he taking in during that time that made well, it Well, interestingly this book? enough, he, I mean, he read the standard authors. He read <clears throat> Dickens. He read Collins, <clears throat> Thackeray. He also read some of the lesser known Victorian novelists like uh, Harrison Ainsworth, who was sort of a thriller writer. Um, you know, very good plot driven stories. Uh, but he, the thing about Hardy, he was a, he was an amazing classicist. He knew his Greek and Latin, so he 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 read the Aeneid in the original. He read Latin poets. He read Greek authors uh, in the original. So he's very well read in the Greek playwrights. So well, that's that's an element yeah. in it too, right? Because Smith is 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 uh, constantly he's, upbraided yeah. about not keeping up with his Greek studies that he was doing yeah. the correspondence or something. Well, that it's a it's a sign of being a gentleman is to know your classical authors, you know. So to know your Horace, to be able to cap quotations if someone quotes Horace, then you got to come up with the next line. <clears throat> but so I am the Aeneid, I am barely a gentleman. I don't, the, I yeah, am by these standards. So the Aeneid was an influence. So Dido, you know, the queen of Carthage, who ends up killing herself. Um, out of love for the departing Aeneas, you know, there's elements, uh, occasional uh, allusions to the Aeneid in the book. <coughs> so Elfrida is kind of queen of this rural uh, town, you know, when Stephen shows up. <coughs> I mean, there's no not close comparison there, but this tragic love story of, of Dido in the Aeneid is reflected to a certain extent in <clears throat> in um, the novel. Also, the Greek playwrights, the uh, Euripides Alcestis, which is about uh, uh, a woman who kills herself for her husband, sacrifices herself for her husband, and then is taken out of hell by Hercules, or, he you know, uh, or uh, <clears throat> Heracles. Um... Uh, Sophocles, Oedipus at Colon uh, no, Oedipus Rex, the ironies of, um, you know, wanting to know the truth, but having the truth ironically bite you in the butt, you know, which is Oedipus's story. Um, Henry Knight wants to know the truth about Elfrida's love life. And of course, that's exactly what she doesn't want to tell him, because if she does, it'll, you know, it's very embarrassing because she ran away with his protege, Stephen. <clears throat> Another interesting influence is a Greek novel called Daphnis and Chloe by an author named Longus. This was considered a Greek romance, and it's about a young, a pair of lovers. Um, I mean, these Greek romances were very idealized. They were, had these characters who were sort of pastoral innocents. And Daphnis and Chloe is about the love affair of these two, and uh, Interestingly enough, in Daphnis and Chloe, Daphnis is is the guy, Chloe is the woman. At one point, she falls in a pit. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry, he falls in the pit. And she pulls him out by tearing up her clothes and making a rope so he can climb out of the pit. And then that's when they start to physically lust for each other in the story. This is so, excellent. This is yeah. an excellent plot device. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, so I don't know. Hardy took that story, uh, you know, that little episode, Daphnis and Chloe, and made it right into his book, you know, where Elfrida <clears throat> rescues Henry Knight by tearing up her petticoat. Why they, isn't this used more often? I, f I figure I would have heard of this. It's a great in, in, device because, you know, in the Victorian world, I mean, you're wearing about two or th women had two or three layers of clothing. And when she takes sense. off her petticoat, she's basically got her dress on and nothing else underneath. And it's all rainy. So she's kind of her whole body is outlined, you know, vividly very, under her it, under her dress. So Henry Knight, of course, is like, oh, my God, this is this is the woman I want to marry. It's very sexy. It's, <laughs> it's very, very sexy. sexy. Yeah, that's why and, I think. Yeah. And practical. Yeah. I mean, you never know when your man <clears throat> is going to be dangling yeah. off a cliff or fall right. into a pit. Yeah. I, I, just, I just feel like this is underutilized in <laughs> cinema and literature and si sitcoms. So, I don't know. People need yeah. to get wise to this. Yeah. Well, 
it's uh, it, it, that's why it would be such a great film because this scene, I mean, this would just be so powerful. You know, he's dangling there, and suddenly <clears throat> she comes rushing up and plays out this this string of uh, of pieces of her petticoat. You know, and of course, how, uh, you how suddenly realize what she's done. Uh, yeah, how do, <laughs> how how would this possibly work in an opera setting though? I'm not exactly I sure. Well, they 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 probably leave that one out anyway. The opera idea, I'm not really sure about, but Hardy died apparently before it went anywhere. Um. Well, you know, it's not just uh, literary influences here, and I was going to ask you about this. I mean, chess has a a big role. Yes, and, chess, and and, and and we we have a character named Knight. Knight, exactly, Henry yeah. Knight. So, what what is Hardy? I mean, I, I can't imagine that's by accident. What is? I haven't had a chance to really think about it. I've been. I jumped immediately into <laughs> Clockwork Orange, but uh -huh. well, uh, it's, it's um, it's uh, I think it's just a it's a vehicle to show you know to to show the character of Stephen and Henry. Of course, Stephen is a young man who she beats because he doesn't. He's not a very good chess player. He's not strategic. He's naive, and then when. Uh, you know, Henry Knight is um, able to uh, beat her as much as he wants. So right. um, it's like he he kind of dominates her on the on the chessboard. And you call um, you say she's a she's a queen of sorts. Yeah. Right. If she's not, so she could she could fit on the board herself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Henry Knight too. The knight of knight uh, for his name is Smith for. Stephen, of course, you know, is reiterates their class affiliation. <clears throat> Henry Knight, you know, has gone to uh, Oxbridge and is a barrister and writes for a a contemporary magazine, the, you know, called The Present. Um, but yeah, I guess you don't get many chess matches in um, in fiction. Although it's surprising that you know recent miniseries <laughs> is based well, on big... that one, that chess player. Um, yeah, the the Queen's the, Gambit or the whatever. Queen's Gambit, yeah. That was... Well, I see. I I picked up on the chess thing because, like, just about in every Kubrick movie, there's a there's a chess match. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, I have I haven't quite figured out what the well, it could be. I think and, it, and was a, was a, it was a big a, chess player himself. So. I think. I mean, I think chess dates back to uh, you know oh, it goes medi medieval way. time. So it could be that it ties oh, in it, with this sort of it goes uh, further back medieval I think it... uh, setting of the story in King Arthur. Of course, one of the other literary influences on the book is the story of Tristan and Isolde, which is very much a part of that area because, of course, Tristan. You know, I mean, there are different versions of the story, but Tristan was sent to bring back Isolde from Ireland to marry his uncle, King Mark, you know, who's the local king there. And he, instead, he fell in love with Isolde, you know, with the love, famous love potion. So the rivalry between Stephen and King and, uh, and Knight is, is sort of roughly based on uh, Tristan and his, his uncle Mark, although that was a more deadly uh, match. Uh, but Tristan and Isolde was... That was being written about. Tennyson uses the story in some of his Idols of the King, which Hardy apparently read in the early 1870s. And uh, so it was part of the medieval uh, revival of the mid-Victorian world to, to know this story. And Hardy himself wrote a, a one-act play called The Queen of Leoness uh, towards the end of his life based on that. So he knew the stories and legends very well. Um, and, uh, so that's another influence. So it's amazing this, you know, not very well known Victorian novel has, you know, it's got Greek literature in it. It's got Latin, Roman literature. It's got medieval literature. It's got sensational elements to it from the world of Wilkie Collins. When, say, when Stephen sees his, the outline of his mother, when he goes to visit the uh the mansion of lord luxellian and <clears throat> where his mother is a maid and he meets with her and elfrida sees the outline of them behind glass 
and you know you don't really know what the hell is going on there you have no idea that that's Stephen meeting his mother uh, that mystery that sensation is very much the Wilkie Collins kind of motif um, and uh, you know he was a Collins was the big, a big author at the time you know and the woman the woman in white um, um, you know 1860s 70s he was one of the big authors <coughs> popular authors at the time So we spoke a little bit about the development of Hardy's canon. Uh, yeah. Do you want to say more about how this fits into that or yeah. kind of exhaust that already? Well, you know, he Hardy is great with the idea of a love triangle. Um, and, you know, you see that immediately after A Pair of Blue Eyes in, in Far From the Madding Crowd in the triangle uh with um uh it's actually you know four players in that um with um the heroine of that book has you know the the macho swashbuckling admirer uh troy and then um boldwood is kind of the older suitor who's smitten with her and thinks of her, idealizes her, uh, kind of in like Henry Knight, but in a, in a slightly different way. Um, and then um, uh, Gabriel Oak is the hero who comes through in the end and gets, the, gets uh, the, the heroine in the end. So we have a happy ending with that, even though Boldwood, you know, shoots Troy and ends up in prison for, for life. So uh, we don't have the, you know, tragic, finale in quite the same way in pair of blue eyes so we have other love triangles uh later on i mean you know tess of the d'urbervilles of course angel claire um and tess uh and then the you know the villain of the of the story whom uh, claire kills so you know the great thing about hardy is he realizes that you know the course of true love always doesn't run smooth. <laughs> I mean, everything is complicated. Nothing, no, people, you know, are not perfectly matched for each other. Um, and um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you can trace out sort of a genealogy of character types in, in Hardy's fiction, um, starting... Uh, well, yeah, starting with this book, pretty much. Because um, uh, the previous novel, Under the Green, which we has kind of a different different set of characters. Um, so it's a repeated pattern, but you're never reading the same story twice. You know, it's all these variations. Um, and uh, this one is... I, you know, the plotting of this book is, I think, just so brilliant um, because so many twists and turns, so many interesting, you know, coincidences, coincidences, accidents. And um, actually, one other literary influence I forgot to mention, um, the end of the novel, I don't know if we want to say too much about it, but when Stephen and um, Henry are competing both for Elfrida and there's kind of a, a comic um, competition between the two of them um, Hardy was taking uh, some of the uh, ideas from a play called Box and Cox by a guy named Morton it was a big Victorian comedy in the late 1840s about two men who live in the same room same apartment but they don't know it and uh they're in love with the same woman but they don't know it and they when they do discover it they go both go running after her to see who can beat the other out and they real they find that she's married someone else but it's a comedy and some of that uh you know confusion and parallelism you find at the end of um a pair of blue eyes. Some of the com well, I think comedy is, but I it, it, you know, of course, the comedy dissipates very quickly. Right. I mean, I think enough times elapsed that I think we could, you know, we could 
we could spoil it a little bit. Yeah. But, if we wanted to. Yeah. But I mean, this probably feeds into my next question. You know, we have this 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 class struggle tension between Smith and and Knight. Is does that carry through in Hardy's work as well, like the love triangle? Yeah, yeah. There's always the kind of working class guy like Gabriel Oak in Far From Manny Crad, you know, um, um Bathsheba is wary about he, she doesn't want to marry him at first because he's a shepherd, you know, low class guy. And she is, even though she is working on a farm at the beginning of the book, she, her family had higher pretensions. They were owners of a farm. And uh, yeah, so that motif runs through Hardy right up to Jude the Obscure, you know, because Jude is this working class guy who dreams of going to Cambridge or Oxford. And he is very well read, and but he just can't, you know, get out of the rut he's in professionally and his marriage is, his marriage to Sue Bridehead is, doesn't help him very much. So that was a persistent theme for Hardy because he came from a low class and he, amazingly enough, he, you know, by the end of his life, he had, uh, he had met all these celebrities and the, and the Duke of Wales came to visit him, and he had the Order of Merit from the British Empire. And, you know, so everyone who was anybody wanted to meet and talk to Thomas Hardy um, in the last 20 or 30 years of his life. Um, and he, you know, he pulled himself up by his bootstraps. And, uh, you know, it's just an amazing story of, of fulf you know, literary ambition and fulfillment. So what can you tell me about the role of dramatic irony in the novel? Yeah. So dramatic irony when, you know, characters know something that other characters don't or when the reader knows things that the characters don't. Um, so, you know, Thomas Hardy is just full of this. So We experience uh, more of the latter, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, you know, of course, the end of the book is just stunningly ironic because the two of them are all excited about renewing acquaintance or, you know, proposing to Elfrida again because they realize that she's available. They think she's available at the end of the book. And, of course, they're riding in a train to go down to her um, to visit her family there. They, they want to, you know, find her in her family environment. Of course, she. She has married, you know, Lord Luxellian a few months or five months before. And, of course, she's dead. <laughs> Her coffin is being pulled at the end of the train they're on. So, uh, I mean, that's, you know, just extraordinary, you know, shock that you get from this book. I mean, the other, I, you know, we could just look everywhere in this book. But I love the fact that when Elfrida is going out to see the boat that... Um, uh, Stephen Smith is coming down from Bristol on. It's called the Puffin. He's sent ahead 200 pounds to put in a bank account, and he thinks he's back in England to do some work for, you know, he's he's been in India for a year or so. He's back in England to do some work uh, at an ironsmith and then go back to India to finish his, um, his assignment there. So he's coming into the uh, area on this boat. Elfrida gets the telescope to watch the boat come in. Of course, she walks down to the shore with Henry Knight. And uh, um, that is it's the key moment, you know, because up to then she's ready to marry Stephen, you know. He's given her money. He's successful. She's pledged to remain faithful. And then they have that incident of his almost falling off the cliff and she saves him and he looks at her in her wet dress and you know is so blown away by her heroism and that you know you know that they're just immediately in love with each other and of course the 200 pound uh receipt receipt for that um 
payment by Smith is in her pocket, and that falls out, and Smith uh, and Henry Knight picks it up. He doesn't know what it is. He picks it up, and uh, <laughs> this is kind of the transitional moment where you know Elfrida doesn't meet him at the church that night. She's supposed to be there at nine o'clock, so they can plot how they're going to pull off their marriage. Now that he has money, and he, you know he's no longer a um, you know a, a nobody professionally. But Elfrida doesn't show up at the church, and um, Stephen is like, you know, traumatized. But and then he, you know, walks around and finds her talking to Henry Knight, his mentor, in the uh, in the garden of the estate where where the family has moved when Mister Swancourt married the uh, the neighbor woman, Mrs. Troyton. So that's another brilliant irony where everything is supposed to go one way and suddenly we swerve because of this, um, you know, the fact that his hat blew off his head. Nothing would have happened. None of this would have happened if his, the wind hadn't blown his hat off his head. Something I got to ask, because it was unclear to me when I was reading it, is that I, I couldn't tell you what Alfreda died of. Is it, yeah, is it, it's, it's um, I would imagine something like typhoid fever. That was very... A common killer in a few days. Did, did it I wasn't, miss it? It like, wasn't a mi- it, it, no. It, you would think maybe it was a miscarriage, but she would have only been uh, like four or five months pregnant. Um, but I think you know it was one of these sudden deaths that you still had in the in the nineteenth century. You know, I think typhoid was one of the big killers. Did this uh, bother anyone? Because I was like. Wow. <clears throat> she was she's twenty and now she's dead. Uh, yeah, well, a little twenty, twenty one or two, I think at this point. But yeah, now that unfortunately, this that was still a reality of Victorian life. You you know, there were occasionally, you know, there was a big cholera epidemic in London in eighteen forty nine. It killed thousands of people. So it wouldn't um, have, Hardy would Hardy wouldn't have been obligated for the Victorian audience to clarify why this young woman just died. No. Get a fever, die. wasn't that uncommon. It happened to, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of examples of just, you know, sudden death. I mean, I mean, tons of kids died in that era, but, uh, the, you know, there were still some big killers like cholera, like typhoid. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess not smallpox, but... Anyway, not not out of the not out of the ordinary to have something like that. You, you, you know, if it was a problem, I think he would have explained it more, um, because he doesn't go. He just said she got a fever and died. I still find it. I still find it curious. I, yeah. I don't know. E- even if even if death was so sudden for yeah. young people back then, I, I still find it curious that Hardy wouldn't at least give well, us a hint, like like. Oh, she got, she, yeah. ho- she got trampled by a horse or she got a fever or something. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you have to look at it. You know, the book is just filled with death imagery. You know, uh, if you notice it from the beginning, there's lots of references to, to graveyards. These Elfrida and Stephen are sitting on a, the grave of uh, uh, Mrs. Jethway's son, Uh you know, Stephen meets Elfrida and Henry Knight in the family tomb uh, after the Lady Luxellian dies. I mean, that's an amazing scene. Um, <clears throat> you know, they're in there looking at the tomb, which has been worked on by uh, Stephen's father because they have to put in the new coffin. I mean, this is one of these family mausoleums where they have, <clears throat> you know, con- caskets in niches inside this family compound <clears throat> and uh you know stephen smith um is there with his father and then uh henry knight you know comes in with elfrida and of course henry knight says oh stephen smith oh you know how are you doing i haven't seen you for a while <clears throat> you know how is your engagement with that young woman you told me about and he says oh well you know i broke it off or it ended he didn't break it off, actually. And Elfrida, of course, is there, you know, just about to faint with 
shame and mortification, you know, because she can't say, oh, there's the guy I tried to run away with um, and elope with, you know, because <laughs> that's her big secret. She can't tell Henry Knight. Um, and, uh, you know, once she tries to keep it secret, she can't get herself to explain it because it's just so embarrassing. And he's such a purist. He's so infatuated the, with the idea that she is this untouched virginal young woman living in in the in the boonies you know that <laughs> he is the only kind of woman he can love because he basically spent his life as a sort of um, intellectual uh, who looked at the world you know purely with his with his uh, his intelligence not with his emotions um, so Death, death imagery everywhere in in that book and a lot of Hardy novels as well. <clears throat> yeah, it just seems, it, which brings us. I mean, we've we've danced around it, but I mean, it brings us into the, the discussion of the theme of the role of chance and accidents. And like you were saying, with yeah, Alfreda, she, it's just all these <laughs> improbable events keep happening, yeah. and she can't talk about them because she's in she's imprisoned by the 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 perceptions yeah. of her era so she can't be truly forthright about what's been going on and so she finds herself in a very uncomfortable situation ultimately possibly leads we don't know that we don't know why she actually died i mean we her her first lover supposedly died i mean the mother thinks he died of heartbreak, heartbreak yeah. right yeah so i mean yeah well it's clear conceivably that the that maybe she died yeah maybe <laughs> he, she... he probably died of tb i mean tuberculosis was that it was another big killer <coughs> at the time um but um yeah so the mrs jethway uh you know i was convinced her son was killed by her but she's clearly a little bit you know cuckoo i mean she you know, she's a melodramatic figure um, who is focusing her 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 grief on, you know, he's, she's scapegoating Elfrida just because her son was fixated on her as a, you know, as a perfect uh, young woman who was of a, a higher social class <clears throat> than him, obviously. So... Well, what else do you think that Hardy's trying to communicate with all these accidental occurrences that, well, that go on? I mean, you know, he's being true to life. I mean, how many of us could say, you know, I, you know, so many things in my life have happened just through the quirkiest accidents of meeting somebody somewhere or um, reading a book about something or seeing something uh, on the web or the TV or something or someone saying something um, or accidents, you know, uh, quirky little things. Uh, but the thing about Hardy is, you know, he, he puts people in this position. Um, and um, the thing is, you have to you have to accept, you have to sort of roll with the punches, you know, to overcome the feeling of victimization to move on, you know, just like the beginning of Tess when she's responsible for the death of the horse when she's taking the beehives to market uh, overnight with her brother in the back, and the the male comes along, and uh, the male guy. Uh, 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 you know, the shaft of the of the carriage goes right into the chest of Tess's horse. And, you know, she's distraught because this horse is the source of the family livelihood, you know. And so she feels so guilty about that. She feels she has to go to the D'Urberville's house to be an apprentice, you know, chicken farmer. <laughs> because she has, she owes her family something, even though she knows Alex is a sleaze, you know, from the very beginning. She feels guilty she has to do it, so she can't overcome the accident of killing the horse, you know, because she's young, she's a teenager, and she takes it on herself. You know, to get over that, you have to say, look, it was an accident, it wasn't my fault, 
it was my fa- it was really the father who sent them out overnight to send the beehives in because he'd been too drunk to do it. So Elfrida, you know, she she can't overcome the feeling of guilt that she's at fault, you know, the fact that she lost the earring and then Knight finds it when they're sitting together there and uh, she can't just explain, yeah, I was here with another guy and, you know, he's gone, but you're here, so so what? Um she uh she does she doesn't have the willpower to overcome these circumstances, which you know is very hard to do if you feel responsible for the things that happen to you because um, it's hard to detach yourself from you know responsibility for whatever happens to you somehow you think it's karma uh, that you've earned somehow. But you don't think that's what Hardy's getting at. Uh, Well, you know, it brings up the idea of, you know, what was Hardy's religion? Of course, he lost his his faith. I mean, in the beginning, he he loved the Anglican service. He was knew the Bible by heart, really. And, um, you know, he lost his faith in his 20s. So instead, he sort of saw the universe as an impersonal, brutal, cruel, mechanistic operation, you know, uh, run by a, um, a very detached, you know, cosmic intelligence. And uh, so all of these events, cosmic events, the the wind that blows off Henry Knight's hat, um, these are sort of a substitute for kind of divine presence. Because, um, you know, life for Hardy in his books is pretty much a big gamble and often tragic um, because <clears throat> people can't get out of their ruts um, either of their own making or not. So as far as the book is entitled, I mean, I became at least I thought I understood what the meaning of the book's yeah. title was. Yeah. Well, what, end, what right? do you think? What do you think of Pair of Blue Eyes? Why? Why that title? Well, isn't that the color of her eyes? It is her eyes. Yeah. Uh, is, so, is there more to it than that? Well, it's a it's a line from a an obscure drinking poem of Richard Brinsley Sheraton um, about how you know it's kind of like if I have a drink. I'll drink to the pair of blue eyes and I'll drink to the nymph with the one eye. It doesn't matter how many eyes the woman has, I'll still drink to her. So it's kind of a funny reference. But I think the the idea is, you know, the purity, the moral purity that she represents. Um, you know, blue associated with heaven. Yeah, with. okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, in the end, was she a bad person? Henry Knight, you know, thought that she was devious and dishonest. No, I mean, you know, in the end, her purity comes through, and that's what both of them realize at the end of the book, but then it's too late. <clears throat> because she, um, you know, she, she's she been put in an impossible situation. You know, too, too, so many weird things happen to her. You know, the coincidence that Henry Knight knows Stephen Smith is his mentor, that he's heard about she, she's heard about him from Stephen, the fact that Smith's parents live right nearby, and that Mr. Swancourt knows the family and they know he's lower class. So and but these are all things that can happen in life. You know, you can get just these the, just the fact that, that Knight reviews her book. I oh mean, yes, right, too. Oh, the uh like, that he that he had reviewed her night, and then he's related to the second Mrs. Swancourt. Yeah, I mean these these are you know you could say oh well isn't that contrived? Well, no these these things actually can happen occasionally. These coincidences, you know. Yeah, situations can just stack up and stack spiral up. Yeah. out of hand. Yeah, yeah. One thing just leads to the other. Yeah, so usually with Hardy, you have a literary reference in the title, or it's just based on the names, name of the main character, you know, Jude the Obscure, Tess of the Durbervilles. So it sounds like this was 
relatively well received. If yeah, it, within limits by the Victor with the, by the Victorian public. I mean, there if someone wanted to make an opera out of it, I mean, presumably <laughs> yeah. it was popular enough. <clears throat> well, as, that's as, that's because he was you know at that point he was already famous for all his books, but the it wasn't his breakthrough book. You know, Fartham and Crowd made him kind of a household name, was widely reviewed. I don't know why this one didn't quite make it. I think it's because the publisher doesn't wasn't that prestigious and he didn't promote it you know that much but you know it was a step forward because hardy it was the first book he actually signed his name to so he could get <clears throat> get known um <clears throat> so um i mean it got reviewed a bit got some positive reviews but fartham Manning crowd was the one that really woke people up to his talent so amongst the do we the do we call them Hardians? What, yeah. what, do, we, what do we call the Hardy scholars? <laughs> Hardians? Hardyites. Hardyites. I mean, amongst them, what do they think about this? What what is what is academic uh what does academia think about? Well, it's Hardy's interesting book, because <clears throat> if you look up the number of articles on this book, they're only about you know half a dozen critical articles. What? Which is ridiculous. What? You know, Farth Man and Crowd has probably 20 or 30. So I'm going to uh, write one. <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit uh, neglected, let's say. I'm going to uh, check. Did, did, did you check to see if anybody had done this, what we're doing? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, but... I, you keep talking. I'm going to check. So... Um, you know, it's in surveys of Hardy's work, of course, it's mentioned. Um, sometimes it's pointed out that it's, you know, relatively, excuse me, neglected. Um, but uh, it's still, I think it, it could have a lot more written about it. Um, you know, Hardy uh, just... Uh, for a lot of people, um, there were flaws to the book. I don't personally. I don't really see what they see. And the, you know, later twentieth century, critics were putting it in his minor fiction, saying, you know, I don't like this. Um, the 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 plotting was too contrived. The marriage at the end was too contrived. To me, it makes perfect sense. So I have a beef with some of the dismissal of the book that you find in critics in the in the twentieth century. But I think. More recently, um, there's been some good writing about it. I mean, I read a very good critical article by a guy named John P. Farrell about Hardy, uh, the uh, pair of blue eyes and the Tristan and Isolde legend. Actually, very good, very good textual uh, influence study. So, um, yeah, so it's really too bad. Um, I mean, you have to be kind of a, a maverick to assign this book if you're an English professor, teacher. Uh, I taught it one year. It went over pretty well. Um, but um, as I say, if this book was made into a miniseries, man, this book would is, it would take off. Uh, it would have a new life. <laughs> and uh, But uh, on the other hand, there is an Oxford World Classics edition of the book which shows that it's still um, considered to be an important work, you know. Which is good. Um, well, I just went through about six or seven pages of YouTube search results yeah. to see, and there's like three people who've done people. Short. short, short, short little reviews, like seven minute long yeah. or whatever. I think, I think we are. I, yeah. I'd have to go into the podcast and stuff like that, but at least on YouTube, no one has ever done what we just did. Well. So. You for Hardy, he's such a well-known author. You know, you get—I mean, you get a ton of stuff on the on the better-known books. But then you have sort of lesser-known people, you know, wanting to highlight some of these um, lesser-known books with you know, ten-minute little book review or clip or something. <clears throat> but um, it'll be—it'll be funny. Like in the year twenty-five hundred, you and I will be like you, <laughs> like we, you and I will be considered some sort of pioneers for doing this. You know. Well, I just hope that we can get someone out there to take a look at uh, 
this for the movie potentiality because I see this as as I just w- a big, a huge hit. Uh, I just want I just want to be famous after I die. That's <laughs> that's what I that's okay. what I'm looking for. Legacy. But we'll do we'll work on the movie thing as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, do do I think we covered all I the bases? Yeah. I mean, I think is that's... there anything else you'd like to say in closing? Uh, no, just go out and read the book. You find it, you know, online with a, if you look up a Google book version or you can get an uh, Oxford world classics has yeah, a very good if, edited, uh, uh, annotated edition. And if uh, you're, if you want, if you want something on the cheap, if you're broke project Gutenberg has it available. You can also listen to it on LibriVox for free. So, you know, yeah. it, if you're, if you're, if you're uh, if, money, money shouldn't be an issue for this. Yeah. Easily accessible. Yes. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Cook. Uh, I'll uh, end the podcast yeah. here. And okay. maybe you can stick around for a second. We can talk about where we want to go next. Okay. Very good. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening.